Hey, RCC family, welcome to RCC Online on Sunday or whenever you're choosing to watch it. My name's Sam, I'm one of the pastors here, and we're so glad you're with us this morning or today or, again, whenever you're choosing to watch this sermon. Uh, It's going to be a a great message for us this morning. I'm excited. We're actually finishing up our doubt series. Uh, Last weekend, we had our baptism service. It was so much fun. It was such a great thing that we got to do that last weekend, and and we were able to do it. It's such an amazing experience to be out there every summer. Uh, With that said, like I said, we're, we're We're finishing up our doubt series today, and with our doubt series, we've been looking at how as we engage our doubts, we can actually grow our faith. We can grow closer to God and our relationship with Him. It can be an awesome thing for us to be able to do. Um, So as we've done that, as we've engaged this doubt series, we've looked at different questions we have, different doubts that we have, and how as we engage those things, we we actually do draw closer to God. But today, today I want to look at it from a little bit different of a perspective. Today, I want to ask the question, what if we still have questions? What if we still have doubts? What if you don't know it all? Like, what if, what if there really are these things that we just struggle with and we can't find out the answers to? What, are of the, what, if, the, what if there are these doubts that we just can't get past? Because honestly, there are just so many questions out there. There are so many things, and as we think about it, there are these times that we get to the point where we have to ask ourselves, what's the line? Like, how many things do I need to know and be certain of in order to make the jump to have faith and have belief? I mean, does God exist, right? I mean, that's got to be a first one. If God exists, and and we can choose not to doubt that, but to believe that, that may be a, a first hurdle to get over. But the list continues. There's, did Jesus really do the miracles that are in the Bible? I mean, there's these amazing miracles that he does. Maybe you've doubted those before. Maybe you've come to believe them. And then we said the Bible. What about the trustworthiness of the Bible? Sometimes that can be a doubt, but as you do your research, maybe you're able to get past that one and and really believe because of all the historical data that backs it up. Uh, But what about Jesus rising from the dead? I mean, that can be a doubt that we struggle with. How do we know for sure? And and maybe you've looked at all the people that have been witnesses to him rising from the dead, and you're like, oh my goodness, of course I can believe that he rose from the dead. And and then finally, uh, as we get even further into it, we might be into some of the nitty-gritty details of our faith. We can ask, am I predestined to do different things? Like, am I predestined to take this cup of coffee and drink it or not drink it? or drink it, or not drink it, or is it my free will? Which one is it? I don't know. Uh, I'm feeling confused and perplexed right now. What's my doubt? Am I going to drink it? Am I not? Is it my free will? Is it God telling me what to do? Really confusing stuff. Sometimes we just don't know the answers to it. And then finally, like, what about mosquitoes? I mean, if there's a doubt in the world, what about mosquitoes? It's just so difficult to know why God would have mosquitoes be a reality. If you've been tuning in on Tuesday nights to our midweek live that we do on Facebook, I I sit in my back deck and I get eaten alive every single week. I don't know what about mosquitoes. This list of questions that we have, they go on and on and on, and, and maybe you've been able to step past some of these doubts that you have. Where's the line? Where's the line as to when we can choose to believe? What's enough to believe And what happens if we can't find out all the answers? What happens if we don't know with absolute certainty, with data to back it up, about every last little question or doubt that we have? For the disciples, they they struggled with this too. They were looking for that one thing that would push them over the edge. Uh, In the Gospel of John, you see Jesus teaching and parables and and telling these stories to illustrate what God's kingdom is about and why he came and all this stuff. And the disciples, as they were following Jesus, in many cases, became very confused. They'd hear Jesus talk, and and it wasn't fitting with what they thought Jesus was going to be, and so they're trying to figure out, like, is this really the guy? Like, is this really the Jesus that we were expecting, or the the Messiah that we were expecting? And so finally, you kind of get the sense that out of this maybe frustration or desperation, one of the disciples, he he finally gets the gusto up to, to ask the question. He looks to Jesus, and he says this. He says, it's Philip. Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Just show us the Father. And I imagine that he had this picture in his head of Jesus opening up the skies and the heavens and God's like nose and nostrils kind of poking through or some crazy thing like that, but, but that's not what happens. And yet, as I think about this and as I, I wonder about it, I, I think to myself, we're the same way, aren't we? 
I mean, we have all of these questions and all of these maybe slight demands to finally have that one little bit more of proof to help us believe in and have faith in God. There's just that one more thing we need. We, we maybe say as we're taking a test, an algebra class or something, and we're saying to ourselves, God, please help me not fail this test. Please help me not get an F and then I'll believe. Then I'll believe. I'll know that you're with me because there's no way I'm not going to do it. Uh, or maybe past that, you're, you're trying to get a job and, and you say to God, like, God, help me get this job. If you help me get this job, I'll believe. I'll be sure of it. Um, then that'll be enough. That'll be proof. Or God, just send me a sign, right? Help me have a sign. Like if there's some sign out there, help me just see it so that I can believe that you're real. Or maybe as we get close to the fall and you're thinking about hunting season, you, you make a little deal with God. You say, hey God, if I get the biggest buck with the biggest rack this year, then I will believe and I will know that you're real. Or maybe past that, you, you're watching a football game and you say to yourself, if, if they can just hit the goal, right? If they can hit the field goal and win, God, I'm going to believe. Or they make the goal, they make the shot, they win the race, any of those things. And you say, if that happens, then I'm going to believe and you got her. Or maybe sports isn't your thing. And so you're thinking to yourself, you know what? If the bachelor chooses the one that I like, then I will, then and I'll believe in you, God. And honestly, I don't watch The Bachelor, so I don't know if you say those prayers or not. But maybe you do. Maybe that's your deal that you've made with God. We've got our things, don't we? We've got the little things that we make with God. I, I know for sure that I can't remember ever saying to God, oh God, I believe in you because I didn't fail the test. But I promise you, I definitely had that moment <laughs> where I was desperate and not wanting to do poorly on a test. And, and I said that prayer wanting to say, hey God, I'll make you a deal. If I could just believe if you do pretty well for me here. I think God knows this is how we operate. I think he knows that this is our demeanor and our, our way of looking at the world. And I think if God were to coordinate the world in such a way where he coordinated around all of our whims and desires for just a little tiny bit more proof, I feel like he'd spend the rest of eternity like sitting down with us and, and answering our questions of doubts and doing little amazing things and miracles for the rest of the history of the world just so that we could have enough proof to follow him except except that's not faith, except that's not what real, genuine faith looks like. And God knows that even if he answers it once, we'll be 10 times later down the road having that same question again. God would never stop doing magic tricks for us if this is how it worked. He asks us to have faith in him. And sometimes there's that reality, right? Sometimes we, we just do it. We, we, just like the disciples, make this little deal with God, and whether it happens or not, it, it's just something that maybe we do. Because even the disciples asked that question. Philip asked the question. But then take a look at how Jesus responds. This is what Jesus says. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. But, excuse me, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. He's saying, Philip, I'm not going to just do some random miracle for you so that you can believe because I'm wondering, have you been paying attention? Like, you've been with me all this time, and you've seen these things that I've done. Haven't you been with me? Haven't you already seen? And Jesus, he doesn't stop there. He actually continues to, che to teach for like two more chapters. He, he continues on for quite a while. He talks about how in just a little while he's going to gift them the Holy Spirit. And he talks about how he, uh, those who love Jesus and follow him will, will do what he says. And he says that he's going to offer peace of mind in such a way that the world can't even understand it. And he says that he's the true vine and those people who are attached to him will, will produce fruit. And that's really good fruit. They'll do these amazing things. And he goes on and on and on for two whole chapters chapters showing the disciples what it's going to look like and how it actually works for Jesus to, to rule the world and for them to follow him with their lives. 
And when it comes to the end of this time, when it comes to the end of these uh, discussions that Jesus has with the disciples, you get the, descent, the, the sense that the disciples are a bit beside themselves. You get the sense that they've just witnessed and, and listened and like it's, it's cracked through their thick skulls that, hey, this is Jesus. This is really him. This is the Messiah. He's the one we've been waiting for. And then they say this. It, it says this. Then his disciples said, at last you are speaking plainly and not figuratively. Now we understand that you know everything and there's no need to question you. From this, we believe that you came from God. So finally, it's enough. Finally, they make the choice to believe. They hear the message plainly and it's, it's a decision that they make to, to follow Jesus, to believe and to trust in him. And in that moment, you, you might imagine, like, it's all done, right? Like, that's it. Okay, we're good. Let's pack up and go home here. We're set to go. But listen to how Jesus responds. Jesus says this. Do you finally believe? But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. It's like Jesus is saying, like Jesus is saying, now that you've overcome your doubts, now that you're willing to move forward with this and actually trust me and believe in me, it's time to get ready. It's time to move because the real journey is actually just about to get started. You've kind of come a little ways by believing, but now, now is where this thing really starts. There's this kind of famous theologian that uh, has been around for forever. Like he was around literally 300 years after Jesus was here. And his name is St. Augustine or Augustine, depending on who you hear it from. But he's this, basically this really smart dude like who writes tons and tons of books, and he was smart even before he became a Christian. But, but he has this thing where, where he was trying to figure out whether or not he wanted to believe. And the guy goes back and forth and back and forth over time saying, yes, it's right, no, it's not, I'm going to believe this other thing, no, I'm not, until finally he has this moment and this experience where, where he comes to faith. He chooses to put his trust in Jesus. And so he had spent much of his time doubting and struggling, and finally he believes. And do you know what he says? Do you know what he says after that happens and after he spends some time reflecting on that decision? He has this amazing quote that that I think is, is really, really wise, especially from someone as smart as him who had spent so much time trying to figure this whole faith in Jesus thing out. This is what he says. He says, Understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. Believe that you may understand. So often, I think we want to prove it before we believe it. We want to get all the facts straight. We want to get everything set. And then we'll finally believe, but, but in reality, Sometimes, sometimes you have to enter into it and experience it and live it before the real understanding can begin to take place. You don't always have to understand something to, to trust it or, or know that it's worth value or know that it's worth your time. I and mean, for example, like I have this phone here, right? Like we all have these things we put in our pockets and, and like I understand a little bit about this thing, but, but in reality, like, it's so far beyond me. Like, I understand there's like microchips and there's satellites and there are, I don't know, towers with cell signal and it's really often not available for my phone when I'm really needing it. And there are like ones and zeros and there's a internet web somewhere, somehow that connects to this phone. And if I like put a question in, it'll give me a lot of answers. Some of them good, some of them not. 
but I, I kind of understand that, but, if I, but there's so much more complexity to this thing that I'd have to go to a whole lot of classes to, to understand the real nuts and bolts of how this thing works, because they definitely don't use nuts and bolts in this thing. They're too small for that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's crazy, right? And yet, we always pick these things up, and we use them daily. It's a thing that we are, rely on so much in our world. That's a phone. It's not God. It's far from it. God's infinitely more complex, infinitely more amazing than the thing in your pocket. Paul says it this way. He says, Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. He's saying, we just can't totally know. It's beyond us. We cannot know, never. There's no no possible way where we'll get to a point where we're advising God. No, God is the one that needs to advise us. We need his advice. We need his leadership in our life. We, We can have faith. We can accept the gifts of wisdom that God gives us and provides, but we can't know it all. There's actually this kind of fancy term that I, I like to use when we're talking about this sort of a thing. I've used it in a sermon a number of years ago, uh, and it's kind of what Paul is talking about. The, the term is this, epistemological humility. It's a real nice mouthful for you, epistemological humility. Now, epistemology is basically this. It's how we know we can know what we know. Think about that for a second or two. How we know we can know what we know. Basically, it's the study of knowledge and the study of the methods that we use to really understand something and how we can actually know we know something for sure. And when you put that word, epistemology, next to another word, humility, and you think about God in those terms, it basically brings you to this conclusion. The conclusion is this. God is God, and we're not. God is God, and we're not. God is God, and we're not. And so as we consider these things, as we consider who God is and this message of Jesus, and as we consider how you can be saved and become part of God's family, and and why we can be who we are as followers of Jesus, and how we get transformed by him into different people who, who lead lives with purpose and value, and how this whole crazy thing and story, amazing God, actually all work together, it's just too amazing for us. It's just too amazing for us. It's beyond us to ever fully grasp. And like St. Augustine says, the only way to begin to understand it more fully is actually by believing and having faith in the first place. And this is sobering a bit. It's sobering to realize that you just don't know it all, and you can't know it all. But it's also healthy. It's healthy because it it takes the pressure off. It's healthy because it helps us realize our limits. Because we've got to understand this. Our doubts, they're normal. They can even be these good things that we use to engage and grow our faith in God and draw us closer to him. But the faith in Jesus that we are talking about is actually bigger than our doubts. Our questions are important, but it's like this. God is not sitting there wanting to spend the next forever answering each and every one of our questions or performing however many little mini miracles or magic tricks so that we can know for absolute certainty that he's there. Like every time we kind of have a little doubt. That's not faith. And it also prevents us from actually living the life that we're supposed to be living, this life of faith in Jesus that is amazing and full and, and crazy and good. No, you get the sense that, that especially from Jesus as he was reacting to his disciples' question of having, them show, having him show them the Father, 
that, that there's something more here. And he's like, okay, great. You finally believe. I'm glad you're there. Now let's get started. Now let's hop in this car of faith and let's drive in the direction of where it's taking us and let's experience it along the way together. Let's begin the journey because before you were just getting ready to start the journey, now we're on it. Now let's experience it and now let's be part of it and work together and it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be challenging but there's so much good in the future and so much that's possible. Epistemological humility. God is God and, and I'm not. First comes belief. And then once we believe, then there's this beginning of understanding and growing and knowing who God is and how God works and how he changes and transforms us. Sometimes it takes experiencing God to begin to understand better how God works. So, Let's not allow our doubts to prevent us from becoming, becoming the people that live as God's family, as people who follow Jesus, who do this work that he has for us to make earth a little more like heaven and that prayer that he teaches us to pray, to be his ambassadors and his representatives, his hands and feet, his lights in this world. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 13. It's that, that passage that you hear at almost every wedding that talks about love at the very end of it, this is what he says. He says, there are three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Sometimes you have to choose faith and choose to have some hope in order to experience that last one love. And it's love and experiencing God's love that really sometimes begins to be the answer for so many of our doubts and questions. There's this apostle or disciple named Thomas, and he was really well known for doubting. He was called Doubting Thomas, and maybe you've heard of him plenty of times before, but he, he wanted to put his hands in Jesus' side and his fingers and his, the holes in his hands so that he could believe. And he gets his wish, like Jesus shows up and he gets to do that and have that experience of, of seeing Jesus and the, the wounds in his body. And in that moment, Thomas says, okay, I believe, I believe. I see you, I believe. But this is, this is what Jesus responds to that with. It's incredible. It's this. It's, then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Which really begs the question, why are we blessed? Why are we blessed when we believe without seeing? I think we're blessed because in spite of our doubts, maybe as a result of us engaging them and working with God on them, and then choosing to believe, when we do choose to believe even without seeing, we get to experience these remarkable things this love from God that results in these tangible things like grace. Grace we didn't earn, grace that just comes and forgives us. We get to experience that forgiveness, freedom from the, the wrongs in our life, freedom from carrying the weight on our shoulders, freedom like Mike talked about last week of, of carrying the load of worry on our backs each and every day. We get to experience transformation. We get to experience God's Holy Spirit entering us, working in us, changing us, and, and making us into new and different people who, who live these lives with purpose. Purpose that, that is actually getting to participate with God and the work he's doing here and now in the day-to-day -day lives that we have. Like meaning and, and value, like the things you do, they matter. We get to experience that. That's a blessing. We get to experience freedom in a way no other thing can provide. Freedom that can only come from God through Jesus. And doesn't it feel good to be free? Free from worry, 
free from the struggle of trying to feel like you're gonna be good enough. God says, I've made you good enough because of Jesus, and I've got good, important work for you to do, and you can do it with me. And it goes all the way into eternity, and we get to experience that together in the best way possible. Maybe you want that. Maybe you don't know it all. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, that's even good. Maybe you're ready to have some faith and belief. Belief so you can experience that faith, hope, and in the most amazing way, God's love that does such an incredible work in us and through us. Maybe you're ready for that. Wherever you're at, here's what I want you to take with you. God is God, and we're not. And what a relief. This doesn't mean stop exploring God. I mean, actually, it means explore him all the more because you'll never get to the end. You'll never have to stop enjoying exploring who God is and all of his goodness. We can explore him with humility and, and never reach the end, but, but don't let your desire to explore keep you from experiencing the actual life God calls us to live right now. Maybe at some point you've said, I want to follow you, Jesus, and you did, but then all these doubts crept in and you just kind of stopped actually living the life and just spent all your time thinking about all the what ifs or I'm not sure about. Maybe today it's time to say, God, your God, I'm not, I want to keep exploring you, but I'm not going to let it prevent me from actually living out this life in my day to day loving people, taking care of people, choosing to show God's love through my neighbors and my family and my community. Maybe for you, you've never been able to make the jump from doubt to belief. And you're worried you're just gonna be stuck there the rest of your life. Maybe today is the day to realize, maybe I have to take this chance and choose faith if I'm ever going to fully understand it. And know that I won't fully, but I'll experience it in a much richer way than I ever could otherwise. If you want either of those things, I'm going to say a prayer, and that's how we're going to close. Would you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your love. Thank you that as we have faith and choose to hope in you, that you give us that love. And it answers so many questions, questions we didn't even know we had. God, as we sometimes struggle with our doubts and it sometimes keeps us from actually living the life that you want us to live, help us to remember that you're God and we're not and we're so grateful for that fact. Help us to release those doubts in, in the way that helps us to actually live this life and experience your love and, and joy and experience being your hands and feet in this world. And God, for those of us who have never been willing to or able to say, I believe in you and I have faith in you, we say right now, I'm going to take this risk, I'm going to take this jump, and I have faith in you, God. I believe in you, Jesus. And I want to experience the goodness of following you and experiencing your love in so many ways as part of my life. I, I ask for forgiveness. I accept your forgiveness. I ask for your purpose. Help me to know how to live for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.